I want to welcome one and all here to the services here in Santa Paula and those of you who are joining us in our Zoom. I want to say that I'm grateful and thankful that uh, Liz, Bob and Liz, excuse me, are, have come back from their trip and they're going to show their experiences and the fact that they're sharing with us, many of us who cannot make this trip or go, they will share with us what they have experienced, what our apostle Paul did on his journeys. I want to welcome you. He'll be uh, discussing the script, a message from Paul in Philipp Philippi. And the scripture is Acts 16. Okay, if you have your Bibles, go ahead, or your apps. Acts 16. This picture is where we were, and this text is actually the text of that explains this picture. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message, and when she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my home, and she persuaded us. So there we were last Sunday, sitting at Lydia's River, and what you can't see, that's Dr. Alan Black, who is one of our tour a participant who was going to give the talk and we're sitting in a mini amphitheater and you could see behind them there's like a little river you could see it's dark and in front of it there was also a river and we were able to wade with our feet in it real relaxing it was a cool day it was Mediterranean weather so it was probably the most relaxing day of our trip and it was also the exact halfway point of our trip so I guess I wanted to just give you a brief Three quick points. So the first point was this. How important was that call? And his point was, it was a major step in our salvation. Amen? It was a major step in our salvation. So here it is. I'll just go ahead and read from it in Acts chapter 16. And it begins in verse um, 6, leading up to verse 10. Paul and his companions traveled through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And after Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So how important was that vision? That Paul actually saw it and actually obeyed it. And uh, one of the things that I learned when I was there is that Greece... The, important, the importance of the Macedonian call was that Greece was considered one of the civilized territories of, or countries of the uh, time of Paul. Outside of Greece was Bulgaria today, or uh, I forgot the uh, Algeria, and they were considered during that time as barbarians, outsiders. They're not considered civilized. So God had to use Paul and his companions to go to a civilized city for and it dawned on me why it was so important. The New Testament was not written in Hebrew. The speak people spoke Aramaic and Hebrew, but what was it written in? What language? Greek. Greek. It was in Greek. Koine Greek. So the influence of the Hellenists, the Greek the Grecian people, really influenced the New Testament writers. So Luke wrote in Greek, all the New Testament manuscripts that we have found in about the 4th century AD are all written in Koine Greek. So their influence was outstanding or astounding. And think about the importance that God wanted these Greeks who still are alive today. Think about the Romans. They're not there, but Greeks are still there today. And their influence has you can see by their temples, have really influenced world history. So that was a major step in our salvation, him 
wanting Paul to, I guess, civilize in a sense, a civilized nation, but to help them understand that this God is the God that we worship is not a God made with hands and not in temples. And that, we learned that, and they, we talked about all these things that they were exposed to. So from Jerusalem to Greece, the importance of the Hellenistic influence, especially the Koine Greek Bible that we have in the New Testament, and then the Old Testament, the first language that, that I understand that the Old Testament in Hebrew that was translated into was the Septuagint. And the reason why they call it Septuagint, because it took them 70 days to translate the Old Testament Hebrew, which is Septuagint, that means seven times 10, 70 days to translate into uh, the Greek language. And they call it the Septuagint. So that's important. So that conversion story, the Macedonian call, this little picture here is important. And... Uh, Think about, I'm about as far away from Macedonia as you could possibly be on this side of the end of the world almost, in California. And yet, the gospel has reached all the way to us. So that's one important point that we learned while we were there, that the Macedonian call and Paul going from, I guess, Asian Minor to Asia Minor in Greece is important for us today. Amen. So here's another thing that I learned if we read the second point I wanted to bring out that um, Paul's ministry would have been only an Asia Minor ministry if it wasn't for his Macedonian call. And the second point was um, if you look in verse 11 in chapter 16. Um, I'm going to read this first and then you'll see why I showed you this picture. The first district, not the chief city. And then you see Philippi there. And then you see numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4. I learned that while I was there. So in Acts chapter 16, it says, okay, they get this Macedonian call in verse 10 or 9 and 10 of chapter 16 of Acts. From Troas, which is near the ancient city of Troy, if you saw that movie. Right? Troy is this inland city, but the coastal region, the port, is called Troas. So it's related to the ancient city of Troy. You can watch that if you want. Uh, famous actors in it. It's about Achilles and what happened in Troy and the Trojan horse. So from Troas, we put out to sea and sailed to Samothrace. The next day we went to Neapolis, which we actually passed by that port, Kavala, today. From there we traveled to Philippi. And here's my second point. Notice how Paul writes it. We talked about the importance of the Greeks uh, and Paul being exposed to the Grecian worldview. But who was in power at the time? It wasn't the Greeks. It was Rome. Because notice what Paul wrote. Paul wrote, or Luke wrote, from there we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony. Very important, a Roman colony. And it says, and the leading city of that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there for several days. So our guide was quick to correct out that Macedonia, this leading city, the district of Macedonia, Philippi, wasn't the leading city. All it meant is they have a number system. It's like school districts. You have the Santa Paula School District, then you have the Briggs School District. Well, in Macedonia, you had four districts. And you see how they're numbered? Number one, eastern Macedonia, where Philippi is located, you had two or three cities. Amphipolis and Apollonia and Neapolis are in district number one. And what the writer was trying to say, it was the first city in that, that district. And interpreters had interpreted that, the first being first above all other cities could be interpreted the leading city or just the first in order. And what he said, it's really the first in order because the next city or the next city they went to from district one was district two and you have Berea or Thessalonica there you can see that there and then you have district three there's Berea and district four you have another place there so he was what he was pointing out that the Roman colony wasn't necessarily just the leading city because Amphipolis was that was actually the capital it was the first city in that district so They've interpreted over the years in this NIV as the above, a city above all others. And really, it should be the first city, the first in that district. So that's a, something that was brought out to me. And the Romans were smart. What they wanted to do is 
make these cities at a key places in the first city so when people pass through they would get all the I guess the money that people would come through those cities and you could see how they made it it was important and then they would go to different cities along the way so what I wanted to bring out is uh, I just want you to notice the references in the reading that I didn't catch until I was there of Roman colony or Roman magistrates how Paul is writing through Luke about all these leaders who really were in control at the time. So one more time in chapter 16, verse 11 or 12b, a Roman colony and the leading city or the first city in that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. Okay, I wanted to make sure and read these texts, right? Okay, now let's skip down to verse 20 in chapter 16. Um, Paul got into some trouble there. He was preaching and there was a lady there was, had this spirit to prophesy about Paul that agitated Paul, and he cast this demon or this spirit out of her. And notice who gets mad. Remember, they're in Greece. The Greeks don't get mad. It's the Roman citizens that get mad. And in verse 19 and 20, it says, When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought him before, they brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews. So they single out their ethnic background. He knew they weren't Greeks. They knew they weren't Greeks. These men are Jews and are throwing, notice what they say, our city into an uproar. And who is the R? We're in Greece. Wouldn't it make sense it's the Greeks that are saying it's our city, we Greeks? But look what Luke writes, or what through Paul's um, experience here. And are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating, advocating customs unlawful for us. And what did they say? Not Greeks, but Romans, to just show who is in power. Here the Romans were in power in the Greek city and the people that were really upset were the Romans because now their commerce was affected by what Paul was doing so they says customs unlawful for us Romans to accept and practice and then I'm going to skip down to verse 37 and 38 so they you know the story <laughs> They illegally throw Paul and Silas in the prison with no trial. Six terrible offenses are guide pointed out. If you look in verse 35, let me just back up there. The magistrates or the leaders, the police officers or whoever they were, the stormtroopers, sent their officers to the jailer. They threw Paul and Silas in prison um, without any trial. Um, that's down in verse 37. They beat us publicly. In other words, can you imagine someone coming and accusing you of doing something you didn't do, and that right away the police officers beat you publicly? That would be a fiasco today. That's, and this is where democratic law or law that we have in California is very important, or, or in the United States, it comes after these Greeks, that we're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to just accuse someone without a fair trial, and that's what these people did. They beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens, citizens. So they beat them. There was no trial. They claimed that they were Roman citizens, not Jews, even though they were accused of being Jews, but they were Roman citizens. Um, they threw us in prison. That's the fourth offense. Just throw them in prison without even thinking about it. And it says, and now they want to get rid of us quietly. They just want to sweep things under the rugs. That happens sometimes. And Paul said, and then they didn't even want to protect them. You know, if they let them out of prison, what happens if this continues again? So let them come themselves and escort us out. So the point that I wanted to bring out on this verse and reading it, and if you read verse 38 here, like, the officers reported this to the magistrates. Magistrates, what Paul said when they heard that Paul and Silas were, what? Roman citizens. Yeah, not only Jews, they were Roman citizens. citizens, And they were alarmed. And uh, Alan Brack brought up this point. Why didn't Paul, or why did Paul, 
wait to this point in the story to complain. In other words, at the beginning, these guys make a fiasco, and he could have told the magistrates right then, hey, wait a second, we're Roman citizens. Please stop them. We have rights. And he didn't. He allowed himself and Silas to be arrested. But when there was a point to speak up, which was the right time, he did speak up. And the point that was brought up, and maybe a lesson for us to learn in the United States how to protest peacefully, is the way Paul did it. And uh, Alan Black brought out, and I learned there, this little extra, this little explanation, lays a framework how Christians who stayed should behave. Remember, Paul left and went to the next city right after that. They went to Thessalonica and Berea. But what about the people who stayed behind? And as a result of their character, a jailer was converted. So how are we to protest? How are we to speak up? How are we to complain? Maybe this is the model for us to remember. And that, that stood out to me. The Romans were abusive. Yes, they treated Paul unfairly, but he did it in a right way. And that was clearly brought up to me. So my first point, how important this Macedonian call was. Yes, they were Greeks. Yes, there was a clash in culture. And yes, there was accusation of rebellion, which I talked about. All this went on through all these stories, even in Corinth and even in Thessalonica, or even when you get to Ephesus, riots in every city. And Paul's leaving a mob leaving them with a model or framework for how Christians are to behave who are left behind. That's us. So, I guess my point <coughs> that Alan brought out and that I'm bringing out is that our citizenship is in heaven. Amen? Amen. Our citizenship is in heaven. Yes, there's going to be problems on earth. Look at the way they treated these apostles. But our citizenship is in heaven. It doesn't mean to be doormats, but it means to think before we speak, including myself, and the times we live in. The last point I wanted to bring up that uh, was brought up at this, in this little story was the impact of household conversions. Right? The impact of household conversions. And I'm going to back up to what I read earlier in verse, I'll start with 12b. And we stayed there several days. So they stayed in Philippi several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate. Let me, let me uh, advance this. Oh, there's Paul's prison, by the way, in Philippi. I just wanted to show that we were there. Um, this slide is in Latin. And you could see, I circled it. It talks about the legionnaire. Legion 6, and F-E-R stands for not only just this legion, but of this legion, it explains who the leader was of F-E-R 2, and it says, Philippe ex testamento, if you can read that, and it's talking about it's in Philippi, and it's in Latin, so those are kind of little, I guess as you go around, you see inscriptions carved in stone, and I saw that, and I can read it somewhat, and so I wanted you to see that. So here we are at Lydia's River, the importance of household conversions, how Christians behave, and if this little extra, this story about how Paul protested, um, lays a framework how Christians who stayed should behave, the last two are just the importance of household conversions and how it affects the people who stayed. On the Sabbath, we went outside to the city gate, to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak, um, to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. And that the important thing that was brought out is this. In a man's world, which was the world of the Romans, even the Jews, why was she the leader of her household? She had to have been, it was brought out, probably a widow, and probably a dad to have about three or four children. She was able to make her living on her own, 
And so as a result of that, they wanted to bring her out as an example of someone that can be a lady who can be a leader in her own household. And she and the members of her household were baptized and she invited us to her house. And this is the point that I learned too. Why would she bring this out, bring this next phrase out or this question out if she knew there were some customs that were being broken here? If you consider me a believer in the Lord, it's not that she believed, she was baptized. But a believer who is credible enough for you to come in to a woman's house without a male figure there, if you believe me credible enough to you to come, believe a believer in the Lord, knowing all this, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And they did. And so her household is an example of what converted Okay, and there's no way around this, but when I think of Lydia, I think of Dixie Carpenter. Her husband has already passed, but she's still a leader of her household. I think of Doris Fox. She has her daughter. You know, as we get older, things like this happen in life, and we're going to be without our mates, right? And so this story is written to remind us this is how we should behave when Christians are left behind and it seems like nothing's left. But the impact of household conversions is incredible. And think about your own household or my own household. That isn't the only household conversion. The other household conversion is in verses 30 and 31. Let me see, I had 15 here. Okay, 30 and 31. The jailer knew that he was in trouble when Paul, there was an earthquake. He was a Roman. He's in charge. And if everyone escapes, he's in trouble. So in verse 30, the jailer, I'll read verse 29. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sir, what, what, must, what must I do to be saved? Why would he ask that? unless he knew his fate was sealed. He knew as a Roman that if he allowed prisoners to escape, he was toast. So he begged them, and it shows this. They, they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. And at that hour in the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds then immediately he and his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house. Think about that. To bring these Jews who were causing problems. Now he's actually taking a chance. Going against the magistrates and the customs of his time. And now he's on Paul's side. Bringing people into his house. Knowing what, if you read the next story. When they went to Jason's house in Thessalonica. The, the mob or that those bad people of the city went into Jason's house to find him. When they didn't found, find Paul, they put a beating on Jason or Sosthenes. You see that? They take advantage of these people who are now siding with the Christians. So this guy's on the side of the Christians now. And Paul, the jailer, brought them into his house, knowing good and well what could happen to him, and set a meal before them. And he was filled with what? Fear? It doesn't say that. He was filled with joy. Because now he's on God's side. He was filled with joy. Because he had come to believe in God. He and his whole, house, his own, uh, whole household. So I guess that's all I wanted to say. The impact of, of uh, generationally in our family ties. And I have right here a picture of a baptism in my family. I don't want to say who it is. But I think of myself being baptized at a 22 year old. I married Liz when my brother introduced us after you had been baptized in your church and said, and introduced, reintroduced Liz to me. Then Russell, her son, was the next down the line to get baptized. Then I believe it was Daniel, then Samantha, then Asher, and all our little grandbabies. And see, household conversions is important for us in the churches, right? Those of us that have been in the church and are praying for our children, that it continues on. So three little implications about just going there. How important that call was is a big thing. You know, the Macedonian call. 
Number two, our citizenship is in heaven, right? In the United States, back in the time of Roman citizenship, they were complaining. And in the United States, things can happen, the politics and all this stuff. But our citizenship is ultimately in heaven, where there is peace. And then the importance of household conversions. And some of you, like me, maybe you've converted as adults, and you still have children that aren't converted yet. Pray for them. Maybe that's your mission in life. And don't wait. Don't be afraid. And if you are, then I want you to have in your mind that image that I saw in Mitiora. What made me cry, I thought about my brother. I thought about my family. The ones that haven't really did, in the way I think, get baptized and accept the Lord the way my mind thinks. And it made me scared. But it gave me hope to continue forward because it is... Sometimes we have to think outside the box, and it's above my pay grade to, be, to play God. It's God's judgment, right? But you and I both know people in our very family, friends, and stuff that may be in that situation one day, and he may be using you for that particular moment and be ready for it. And that's what I learned when I was there. Don't, don't wait. And uh, anyways, keep that in mind. It was a great trip, but more importantly is what we saw why God sent us thousands and thousands of miles away just to see these stories that are actually true. And there's evidence. I mean, Gallio's inscription, the Erastus find, just different things I'll show you more next week. Some of the things that were found that God gives clues once in a while to remind Christians that this stuff is true and the atheists who try to disprove Christianity usually get converted themselves or have to eat crow, you might say, because some of this evidence comes out in archaeology that's not even in the Bible that supports God's word. So think about those stories as you read them, and uh, may God bless you, okay, on this Sunday.